an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. And we welcome everybody in this morning. Went to the Oriole game last night. Has to be a bit of like self torture to watch the Orioles. It's almost unbelievable how bad they are. It does take a little bit of masochism, <gasps> that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. But let's talk about what's the real headlines today. Besides Argentina and Iceland, which is on the World Cup stage today from Russia, uh, more than anything around here is the U.S. Open. And to discuss that, we have Pat Corner in. Pat, welcome in this morning. Bruce, good morning. Well, our predictions just about went down the toilet, as they say. <laughs> well, we we have some that are still in there and some that uh, that are uh, still asleep. Well, let's start off by talking about I. You know, I've been able to watch just about all of uh, the coverage in the first two days, mm-hmm. and to me, what really just totally blew me away were two things. Number one was DJ's steadiness Dustin mm-hmm. Johnson from you know I was texting you during his round and when everybody else was falling apart he was driving in the fairway and putting the ball in the green yeah and yeah. I, I out of the 36 holes uh I'm not sure how many bogeys he had maybe about maybe one or two and he had six yeah, a couple maybe yeah his six six birdies but that's not the point he had probably 20 tippins happens right. for par and nobody had that no and and that's uh tiger woods even uh, alluded to that in his press conference uh you know because he watched it for two days and he just said that uh yeah you know it was it was as stress-free of a four under uh as he had seen and he had a lot of looks and and just put him in position to where par was basically the worst score he was going to make on most of those holes and as we know in the U.S. Open, pars are good, and if you if you pick up a few birdies like he has, it's uh, you do what he's done. He's uh, he's already distanced himself from the field. You tell me how that one par three that's 157 yards uphill yeah. is causing right. triple bogeys. I don't understand it. I really there's got to be a safe way to play that hole. Yeah, you we we don't. We don't get a true appreciation for it on the on the TV. The the landing area on that hole, uh, you know, we see the green as the landing area, but the landing areas on some of those holes are so tiny because of the firmness of the greens and the runoff uh, on all sides of the greens. So the guys are forced, even though they're hitting short clubs in, they're forced to land it basically in a in a ten to fifteen foot area and then when you get the wind blow and that just magnifies the difficulty and i said two things struck me about it and we'll go through everybody but the mm-hmm. second thing was one of your favorites and that's henrik stenson right. he is the true definition of a beast he, oh gosh he's the most masculine other than dj maybe i mean just the way stenson plays he just smashes it out there and you know, he looks like Ivan Drago from the old uh, Rocky movies out there. How do you get an eagle on a 620-yard par 5? It, I, it doesn't yeah. even make sense. It's not right. even in conception that you could do that. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's uh, and a lot of times he's Stenson's one of those guys that rarely even hits driver. Uh, he hits three wood off the tee probably 90% of the time, and he hits three wood out there so far and so straight that he's still attacking the holes. So it's an interesting field, and I think the one field, and you were teaching, and I'm texting you, keeping you updated, mm-hmm. and what did you think when you looked down and I said that Rory shot an 80, Tiger shot a 78, and uh, right. who Spieth. else was, and, and Spieth shot a 78 or something. Yeah, it was, you know, I had two thoughts. My first thought was, wow, that place is really difficult, and my second thought is, you know, we could at that point we could potentially have a weekend where the TV viewing goes down the tubes because if all the big names are out of it, then 
you know, anyone other than the diehard golfer is not really going to tune in. But, uh, but yeah, it's funny. I never, I never think about that. I just think yeah. about golf, you know. And uh, yeah. one guy that I've been amazed with, and what a screw up he had on the last two holes, is Ian yeah. Poulter. I watched him win the tournament a few weeks ago, right. and right. what this guy's like having a rebirth. Yeah, yeah, he. He has. Uh, there's no better way to put it. He's, uh, yeah, I heard him talk. He's, he's changed some things in his, he has a lot of uh, business ventures off the golf course. I think he's gotten a, a little bit more uh, organized with that. Um, you know, his kids are of a certain age where all of a sudden you, you and I both know how that is, where now that's, that was taking up some time and he's just sort of rededicated himself to golf and, and he's, he's certainly uh, showing some great form. But that 17th hole, I don't, you know, he had a bad approach shot, but he was still in the greenside bunker, and all of a sudden it turned into, you know, something something we see at our clubs on the weekends. Right. I mean, you know, it's a normal shot for me when I fly a you know, fly part of the bunker, but <laughs> he said that a bad shot would have been 20 feet from the hole. That's what right. he said. Not right. 30 yards over the green. And, yeah. uh and then to compound it with that next shot, he was lucky he got out of there with a triple. Right? He was very lucky. Yeah, that one could have that one could have turned into a nine or a ten really easily. Yeah, I, it was unbelievable that he he was one shot behind uh, Dustin and then he dropped mm-hmm. four, so now he's five back. Certainly still reachable. All right, yeah. so forty four of the latest fifty open winners came from the top ten after the second round. Mm-hmm. So I took the top 10, and we'll go down them real quick one at a time. We'll go backwards. Who else mm-hmm. but Ricky Fowler finds a way to get in there? Right? Yeah. Uh, well, Justin Thomas is just outside of there. Uh, he could certainly have a, you know, a good round, which, you know, in these conditions, good round is, uh, you know, two under, three under. He could jump a lot of spots. Mark Leishman is a guy that always seems to play well in big events. We don't really talk about him, but. But he's just outside that number. Well, um, here's the thing. 88% of the winners come from that top 10. Right. So, oh, yeah. you know, Ricky Fowler's at plus two, barely on TV. They barely right. showed him. I mean, I that's why I was surprised, because but he kind of came on late, as did mm-hmm. Jordan Spieth, but Jordan fell short. Russell yeah. Henley was at the leaderboard day one, fell back to yeah. two over, still in the hunt. Poulter. Kepka, one of your yep. picks. Yep. Justin Rose, one of our picks. Yeah. Uh, Hendrick Stenson and another one of your late picks, Tommy Fleetwood. Yeah, Fleetwood, sure. Are all plus one. And I was impressed by Tommy Fleetwood. First time yeah. I've ever really watched him closely. Yeah, he's he's phenomenal. He's uh, he's one of those guys when you you talk about the the best current players without a major. Uh, in my mind, he's up there because he just he just strikes it so well. All the time. Kepka very confident after, I don't know if you saw his press conference after the 18 yeah. holes, but he says, I'm playing better than anybody here. And it's just mm-hmm. a matter of, you know, I, all right, here's two questions for you before we get to Charlie Huffman and Scott Piercy. Yeah. Two Americans in the top three. Uh, if the weather is benign today, sunny and beautiful and no wind, mm-hmm. to me, that favors DJ. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Because I don't think, I don't think he's just going to all of a sudden back up too much uh, under good conditions. I think it would take something that just makes him uncomfortable: sideways rain, or a lot of wind, or or whatever it may be. Yeah, I think it takes it would take bad conditions to get him out of his groove. Like uh, mm-hmm. you're right, so you know, hits a bad. He's not going to hit. You know, he might hit one or two bad drives, but right. I've been watching him, man. He he aims. That ball goes exactly where he was, and I didn't hear the Tiger said that it was a a pain free four under. But yeah. I watched every hole. I'm telling you, he had out of 36 holes probably 20 tap ins. Yeah, oh, I know. It's it's just the way that it's it's the script for how to play a U.S. Open, and and he uh, and his caddy, who's also his brother, it just it looks like they they're just getting better and better as a team because. You know, the knock on DJ was was always in in the past that you never knew when that bad decision or the or the wild tee shot was going to pop up. But but now, I mean, they're 
they're working as a team. They're hitting irons off of tees because, of course, he can hit a three iron 300 yards out there. But he's he's just taking a lot of the potential big mistakes out of play, and and then he's hitting his spots and he's and he's tapping it in. So he's he's really just doing everything right. All right, let's talk about Scott Piercy and Charlie Huffman, mm-hmm. uh, two guys who this season have been in the top ten. I think almost every tournament. Yeah. What do yeah. they What do they bring? Charlie Huffman, you know, really brings a steadiness to his game, and Piercy yeah. seems to be the same way. Yeah, Charlie Hoffman, I mean, we've seen him, you know, when I think back to maybe the last four or five majors, he's been in contention in all of them. Uh, The last two Masters, he's been right there. Um, So he's one of those guys that just seems to need the right break at the right time just to to break through. Um, You know, I I heard someone mention that he was a journeyman last night. I don't don't really see Charlie Hoffman as a journeyman at all because he's won – however many times, three, four, five times on tour, and he's, he's always in contention. Uh, Scott Piercy's a little different. He, he came on strong a couple years ago where he really he won a couple tournaments. He played very well, and then he, he battled through some injuries. So he disappeared for, for two seasons, and now he looks like he's back. Um, he's just a complete ball striker, hits it great. Uh, I've been able to stand on the range and video his swing, and it's one of those swings that, that I'll even show people as far as how good it is. And a lot of people don't even know who he is, but uh, just rarely makes a, a big mistake. Uh, putter runs hot and cold. So that's, that's going to be kind of the telltale of how he plays this weekend is, is uh, really how the putter behaves. So you have 10, 10 out of the top 10, you got six guys from the U S and four euros. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, uh, let's, let's talk about, uh, who's the two? First of all, the two guys. Let's go to the last two twosomes mm-hmm. on Sunday. Who's going to advance today? Who's going to rise? And I think you and me might be in dead agreement, but I'll let you go first since you're the guest. Yeah, I have in my last two twosomes. I have Rose and Fleetwood, um, second to last, and then uh, I've put kind of the the bro group, as they call them, because they're close friends, they work out together. And uh, but DJ and Kepka, uh, also interesting enough, the last two U.S. Open winners. So uh, I think that would be a pretty nice mix. But then right behind that, I have Stenson and Fowler, and and uh, you could go so many different ways. But I like Rose, Fleetwood, DJ, and Kepka. Yeah, I think that uh, you're convincing me on Kepka, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, I happen to love. I think the final twosome is going to be Rose and DJ. I, I pick yeah. Rose. I'm, I'm not. It's after watching DJ. I just don't see any flaws. I'm not sure who's yeah. going to beat him. But then again, you know, on this particular course, it takes two bad drives to mm-hmm. lose four shots. Right? Yeah, well, you know, or or just a, as we saw with Poulter, one bad bunker shot, and all of a sudden you're in a you're you're scrambling to try to make double. Yeah, but I, I, I see DJ and uh, Justin Rose, and I'm not going to sell Charlie Huffman out of this. No, I think no his, he's right there. I think his consistency has been uh, utterly amazing, and uh, a long shot for me, and I picked him to be in the final group, is still Ricky Fowler. I don't Ricky know why, Fowler, yeah. but Ricky Fowler came on in the Masters like he was like nowhere to be yeah. found and came on strong. And uh, I, I just, you know, I don't know. You know, I, I wouldn't be shocked if any of these 10 guys won, which to me, and that includes Poulter, too. Right, sure. Uh, sure. Uh, and, uh, and real quick on Fowler, I mean, I think it's a great pick. And, and uh, also, he, play, he goes off at 226. The leaders don't go off until 310. So, you know, the way the groupings work, if he posts early, uh, the first one in is going to be the last one out on Sunday. So, that's why I put Kepka in the last group too, because you know if these guys post a score early, uh, even if someone ties, then they're going to be playing in the later groups. So, uh, so yeah, we could have a lot of volatility on these last pairings. Well, the other day I said Tiger had two chances. That was slim and none. All right, <laughs> you said that about Phil too. Yeah. Oh, Phil was never even in my mind. Although he's talking yeah. about a comeback. I know. I He's going to come back. He, he says if he puts one in like a 65 today and right. gets within range, you know, and goes out early and posts the score. He's dreaming. He's dreaming. <laughs> yeah. Because here's a guy. He, I think he led, the, he led the group in fairways hit yeah, and scored horrible. 
I know. And when's the last time Phil Mickelson led in fairways hit? I wonder uh, if it's ever been done. I, I don't know. But uh, Tiger and Jordan Spieth, all right? Mm-hmm. Tiger mm-hmm. finished at 10 over. He was plus seven on one and two. And if you listen to the experts, and, you know, I think the, the play-by-play play has been pretty good. Yeah. Number one's the easiest hole in the course. And right. Tiger gave up, what, five shots to it? Yeah, it's unreal. How, how does that happen? And then Jordan was plus seven on 10 and 11. Mm-hmm. I, I don't understand. This course must be a literal nightmare. Have you ever had the chance to play it? I haven't. I've, I've never been there. I've, I know quite a few people who have, and they all... They all share the same opinion. They all say it's beautiful. It's one of the greatest golf courses in the world. But my gosh, it just beats you up. And uh, I feel the same way about Oakmont. I don't know if you've had a chance to play Oakmont, but it's the same. It's you appreciate the history and the tradition and the and the just the the design of it. But to play these places every day would just wear you out. Yeah, there's no doubt. Listen, I can say that the one toughest course I've ever played, I've never played Carnoustie, but mm-hmm. when I went to uh, Scotland, I did play Royal Troon. And, yeah. I, and yeah. I played it in the wind and the rain, and i got to tell you something. I didn't see 200 because I didn't finish half the holes. I mean, right, right. it opens up, I think, with 210 over the burn, all right? Right. I mean, it was right. like 210 carry or something. It's impossible. Yeah, like welcome to Troon. Yeah, it's impossible. Yeah. And, uh, but what a great historic course. Well, Pat, I tell you what, this is, you and me will be texting like crazy tomorrow on Father's Day. Oh, yeah. Always yep, the best true. father, always the best holiday of the year is Father's Day, the day of the U.S. Open. There's nothing like it. Question for you. Yeah. When is the PGA come up earlier this year? PGA is wow! You just you just stumped me. Yeah, yes, it is. Danny's looking uh, right now. In other words, right, yeah, yeah. The British Open is the final tournament this year. They changed that to try and get it all in for whatever reason. But uh, August 9th to the twelfth. Ninth to the twelfth. That's normal. Yeah, and, August, the, and the British yeah, Open it, is when. Yeah, I think the British Open is still in July. So this year still is... Uh, next year they're changing it, right? Next year it changes, yeah. Yeah, July 19th to the 22nd for the Open Championship. Okay. Right, so, right. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the Players' Championship also changes next year. It goes back to March. I still say one of Tiger's problems is he's not playing enough tournaments. You know, yeah, that's why it, I, uh, I, I just... Uh, and he, he's not making the putts like he used to. It's pretty simple. No, no it's... Uh, you know, it's... I think we can put the injury to rest, at least for now. He seems very healthy. He's swinging freely. Um, the difference is he's not making the putts. He's uh, he's showing a little bit of, didn't think we'd ever say it, but you, you talked about it just a minute ago, the fact that his first two holes have given him the biggest problems. You start to wonder exactly where he is mentally and how comfortable he is starting these these tournaments of course one of the days he started on 10 so it's it wasn't his first hole but you just wonder how confident he is right now well here's what i think about tiger and we're all forgetting he's just mm-hmm. coming back from an injury yeah and absolutely. sometimes it could take it could take this entire season mm-hmm. for him just to get his game straight yeah. and uh if he stays healthy people should be looking next year to see a right. a, a better tiger it just doesn't yep. seem like it's going to happen this year. But uh, they said something yesterday that in his backswing, he was holding up because he wasn't confident. Did you hear that? I did not. Yeah, like he, they could not. tell there was a hesitation in his swing just to play it safe. Hmm. Okay. You, you know, kind of like if you take a half a swing and you hit it 150 sure. yards or something, you know. Yeah, little little punch shots. Uh you know, some of that is just keeping the flight down and the spin down when the wind blows. Um, but he's probably the only one that could really answer that as far as is what he was trying to do. Well, day one, the winner was Shinnecock. There was no doubt about it. Yes. And, yeah. and and day two, toward the end of the day, when the wind died down, the birdies started flying in. Mm-hmm. And I could be a very fascinating couple days if there if the weather is benign. Yeah, or DJ yeah. could wind up winning by nine strokes. I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, we could see a real nail biter and a and someone come 
come back from, you know, a few, few groups passed or tomorrow could be a victory lap. Um, it just depends what Dustin does today, I think. Yeah, well, we shall see. Pat, as always, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll be talking in the next couple of days, and then we got the Open within a month, yep. and uh, we got a lot of, a lot of good golf coming up. Uh, right now, right first of all, who's the captain this year for the USA in the Ryder Cup? Jim Furyk. Furyk. And Furyk, yeah. Tiger is his key assistant? Correct. Okay, that's interesting, yeah. which means... And, and Stricker, I believe. And Stricker, and which yeah. kind of means that Tiger's in line, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, it'll be... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Stricker gets the next, uh, the next one. And then um, Tiger. And, and then Tiger after that. And then Phil, of course, is going to be in line also. Right, as they all should be. Yes. Pat, I love having you on. Always great to see you. When's the Maryland Open? Is it has it been yet, or is it a couple? Maryland weeks? Open is in uh, July. In July, uh, actually, right around the British Open time. Are you playing in it? It's a sore subject, Bruce. It's the first time I've ever done this. Um, I didn't get my entry in on time. Oh my god! <laughs> I had we had. Uh, the way it works is the the tournament isn't until July, but the qualifying rounds for it are in uh, in May. So the entry deadline is early in April. So a lot of times you're not necessarily thinking that far ahead. Um, unfortunately, this year we had my grandmother pass away. We went away uh, for the services for four days. When I got back, I started thinking, you know, I bet that deadline's coming up. And I looked online and I had missed it by a day. Oh, my Lord. So, uh, yeah. You so, should have called well, me. I got good pop with the head of the USGA. <laughs> well, yeah, it's true. But, uh, no, I'm teasing but, yeah, you. I try not to use pull in these things. but um, Oh, no, these guys run by the book. Oh, yeah. No, right. and I, and, uh, but, no, so long story short, I uh, I lost it mentally for a few days and didn't get my entry on time. But, uh, but you and I will still, uh, still be talking about it. It'll yeah, be a great for, time. yeah, for sure. And uh, maybe you'll get out there one day with me. Yeah. That'd All be right. Great. Patrick, thanks for coming yes, on. We'll see who's right, who's wrong, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, Argentina just scored, but I was just gazing at this real quick. Iceland dominated early. He had three opportunities and could not convert. Iceland is, uh, if you remember, two years ago in the Euros was the ultimate uh, underdog. So I would love to see them knock off Messi for uh, one win in this uh, group stages here. Uh, it's not going to happen. I, don't think. <laughs> I think that ship probably is, not. I think that ship has sailed. They needed to get on board first. Yes, I'm with you. Uh, with that, we'll head out to our first break. This is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven, and this past segment was brought to you by Coons Ford. I've been by there yesterday, Danny. And listen, if you're ready to buy a car, today's the day because they serve a lunch that would kill. All right. I might stop in there for some crab cakes and uh, a lasting king crab. I mean, they treat the people right on Saturday who buy cars because they're so busy. They have to kind of keep everybody entertained. But besides that, their inventory is unbelievable. Their deals are insane right now. And it's a great time to go in there and buy a car. This is Bruce Posner back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, Sports Maven. All right, welcome back here to segment two of Coons Ford presents the Sports Maven. And uh, Danny, I went to see the boss the other night, and it was on Broadway, and it was just, I don't think the only word to describe it was stirring. Yeah. All right, because it wasn't what you would expect. It's not a concert. No, it well it was a concert in a way, but it was like a a storytelling episode, like you would think back to the old Harry Chapin days. Well, I don't know if you know who Harry I Chapin know was. Who he is? Right, He's a little before my time. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. But Harry Chapin was a storyteller, and Springsteen went through his songs as a storyteller and played some on different songs that I've never heard before. And his wife joined him for a couple songs, but it it I think for an over sixty crowd it was even better, which what the crowd looked like to me or over fifty anyway, where he really talks about his life, his relationship with his father, his closeness with the 
uh, the big man Clarence Clemens. Uh, it was just fantastic, and he closed it. Uh, he closed it with a combination song of "Dancing in the Dark" and uh, "The Land of Hope and Dreams." And those two songs don't seem to like, but his mother loved to dance, and you know he had a little politics in there. All right, not much, but he's not the kind of guy who's going to throw politics at you. He is certainly a liberal, progressive thinking person. But, you know, I thought that uh, his Tony Award performance, I don't know if you saw it, was not vintage because I think he might have been thrown off by De Niro a little bit. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was that as much as the fact that um, when you do your your Broadway play, you're in a routine. I mean, he's been doing this for months now. And then when you get up and do it on a, a TV constrained performance and you have to do this truncated version of your show but i mean i've heard nothing but good things i mean i I know people who are you know springsteen fans for life who go there and i also know people who aren't springsteen uh super fans who go and leave there crying you know it's just just an emotional experience i mean anyone who's gone through you know a a coming of age i mean that that's what the story is it's the story of him you know starting as a young rock and roller and making his way to the grizzled veteran that he is well said for somebody who didn't see it, but that's what it, <laughs> that's what it is. But uh, it was just really, really special, and the theater was just so small. I yeah. couldn't believe it. Now I know why the tickets are so expensive, because the theater I was sitting in uh, ten rows from the stage in like the corner, and there was only about three rows behind me or four rows behind me. It is small. It is little, and the balcony overhangs. So I, if you have a shot to get tickets or whatever, don't be concerned where the tickets are, right? Because it, it's kind of like every man theater. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it, it's so small that it really doesn't mean much. And uh, it was just great. I loved every second of it. But his best line, and I only give one line from the show was he said that, uh, you know, he talks about being the average working man and how it's a myth. He said, I've never worked nine to five, five days a week in my life. He said, until now. Until now, yeah. Until now. And he says, and I don't like it that much. (laughs) But uh, That's great, Bruce. It was great. I loved it. And uh, New York, it's something about New York. It's so magic. I I was telling you I have a sciatica problem in my in my right thigh and I couldn't walk around a lot which I love to do in New York but I went to Times Square because I was staying around there and I just like 1030 at night just grabbed a chair sat down got a Diet Coke and watched these five guys doing some kind of a, a rap show and other five guys performing an act from a play and thousands of people on the street. There's never, there's really no place in the country where people watch the Times Square. Listen, world, not the country. Yeah. There is no better place in the world than New York in that area. And uh, as far as safety goes up there, you saw nothing but guys in flak jackets, all right, armed to the nth degree all over the place. Uh, You know, I don't have those kinds of fears, but if uh, somebody did, there's no need to. But uh, New York is alive and well, thank heavens. And uh, I went to a restaurant at 1030 at night, all right, called Junior's, right in that area. It must have had 300 tables. There was a 45-minute wait for a table at 10 o'clock at night. Think about that. 45 minutes. They said, the only shot you got is to go to the bar. You know, so I went in the bar yeah, area and I waited for somebody to get up and I sat down. But uh, it was great. That's all. So that's New York. That was my New York trip. Awesome. And then I come home and go to the get home in time to go to the Oreo. Club. <laughs> some some ironic about that. <laughs> it's quite the turn. All I can tell you is Atman's Deli is busy as can be. All right. Yeah. It's the, it's, listen, it's the best uh, place to stop in the entire stadium. There's no doubt about it, and uh, there's 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 beer samples, very valuable. Yeah, you know what? I think it's interesting now that they they did some great things with food at the stadium. Number one, they give you options now when you buy liquids. Right. They have a little cup of beer, so if you just want the taste of a beer, and you're not looking to get a fifty dollar drunk on by drunk buying six beers. Right. You could buy a beer for four dollars. Yep. All right. 
you know, it's not going to like fulfill that crazy beer t- thirst, but people buy it. And yeah. they have small Diet Cokes for a dollar fifty or two dollars, and they have a whole stand where I think the most expensive food is three bucks. So like uh, hot dogs on a stick or whatever they call yeah. corn dogs. Yeah, and, and then they, 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 I saw they have and they have PB and J's for the kids now. And uh, I saw that the Ravens Stadium, M and T Bankers, is doing the same thing this coming year. To, and, and and that's what yeah, they, they need to do to get, to get these families dra- back out there. They drastically drop prices. But I got to give a shout out to the great Baltimore Oriole fans because they've taken a lot of heat this year. Why I'm not sure. I think the crowd was twenty six thousand last night. And that's what I was told it was early. And that's incredible for this team on a gigantic losing streak. The dullest this team is duller than the Ravens' offense has been. I, I I don't even know. I, it's like I'm not sure how they score runs anymore. And having a guy on third with less than with nobody out is like to the Orioles a 50-50 shot of scoring. It is just incredible. And then once again, who pitched last night? Was it Kashner? Yes. No, good. No, it was no, no, Galsman. No, 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 it was Galsman. Galsman. Right, right. Kashner's on the shelf right now. Right. Galsman just got in and out of jams all night. Gave up two runs. I mean, come Listen, on. The pitching, uh, we, we talked about this last week. Uh, the pitching has been the least of the Orioles' problems lately. And I don't think it makes that much of a difference with stinks. I mean, uh, we were we were joking on the show on Wednesday on, on, on Terry Ford. We were saying, are they going to reach uh, 20 wins first or 40 losses first? Because they went into last night in 19 and 48. Right, 50 and losses. It's close. It's, it's, and, and, no, I and, think they'll win today or tomorrow. Bundy goes tomorrow. I think they'll get that game, but I wouldn't swear to it. I got to tell you, this is no lie, and I, I will never profess to be an expert on baseball, especially National League baseball. Okay, I kind of know the uh, Nationals. Okay, all right, but that's it. But I got to tell you something. I looked at this lineup that Miami, oh, Miami. has. Oh man, I never heard of one person. No, no, it's rough right now. It's right? rough. They have, I mean, they have the a pitcher's catcher. name. Was Jose Urena? Urena, and I'm thinking I heard of Jose Uriba. I must be seeing a making an Anna B. You know, I never heard it. I mean, like I've never seen a team like this. No, I mean they've they've done the full teardown, and that's the that's the frustrating thing, Bruce. People talk about how is this team, this 2018 Orioles, worse than the 1988 Orioles, and I say yes because if you look at the ages of the players on that 88 team, they're all in their mid, except for Fred Lynn, Eddie Murray, and Mike Boddicker had just turned 30 years old. The old the oldest core player on that team was Cal Ripken at 27 years old. These were all a bunch of 24, 25 right. year old kids. This is a veteran team of of players who've had success in the league and I think that 1988 type season of, of young and haplessness that's next year this is gonna be a couple of years before we're back to fun times at this the is this is you look at the you look at the field and who's playing and you're looking at scope and Machado and Adam Jones and Trumbo and Mancini and you say well how do you get shut out by <laughs> a guy what was his record it, it wasn't good I mean the, the Marlins are not good as you can see by their lineup, he had not a good. one hitter going into the seventh inning. The Orioles make it easy on opposing pitchers. That's now, for sure. here's one thing I heard on the radio, and I'm not sure I have an answer for it. You know, first, it's obviously it's not working. First and second, nobody out. Get the ball and play. Bunt. I mean, do something to to like keep the game going, and they don't do anything. No, no adjustments. I mean, day after day, game after game, they don't score. Well, Chris Davis is now out of the lineup. That that's that seems to have been a case. He missed his third straight game last night. And Buck well, they Showalter say they're working. Out. They're working with him. But he also, they also said that he, he's not going back into the lineup until Buck is told by the people working with him that he's ready to. So who knows how long this is going to be? But it looks like this is going to be the first prolonged absence without Chris Davis, and we should we shall see. Yeah. All right. With that, let's go out to break number two. After that depressing. Uh, <laughs> hey, I liked hearing about Bruce Springsteen. That was yeah. nice. Yeah. Well, you know what? I mean, I'm so crazy. I'm going again today. So, I mean, I love the Orioles and yeah. I love baseball and I love Camden, Camden Yards. And, you know. Did you get the floppy hat? No, I did not. I forgot. But today's the uh, Dylan Bundy bobblehead. So get No, there. that was Tuesday. The bobblehead was Tuesday. Was it? Okay. Yeah, you know what? It was a great crowd, and man, they love turkey. All right. <laughs> it was a great turkey crowd. All right, with that, we'll be back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300. 
This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. All right, this segment is brought to you by Science and Kirk, uh, the best place to go for any kind of personal injury claim. And when you call, Danny could do could answer the phone. I could. All right. I could. Danny could Danny could help you through your case under the guidance of the science guys and the Kirk guys and the their experts. There's nobody better and take cases from all over the country. So that's Science and Kirk, also host of In the Nest, coming up. Uh, a lot of Lamar Jackson talk this week. But right now, we're going to turn it over to the NBA draft and uh, bring in my NBA draft expert as well as the editor of inside the crease lax.com and that of course is todd carton todd how are you today i'm doing fine bruce what's so but funny and thinking of me as an nba draft expert well, well, come on todd <laughs> come on we all know the truth <laughs> we all know the truth one, one thing really fast i gotta say bruce is i, I was listening to your segment with uh, pat right and and you know how many how many players that finished in the top ten at Augusta do you think are currently in the top ten at uh, the U.S. Open? That's a great question. I would say the way you're asking it, yeah, it's, <laughs> probably, asking. it's probably none. But I'm going to say Ricky Fowler was right. Brooks Kepka, Brooks Kepka, nope, nope. Uh, I'll say three. You hit it right on the head. That was there you go, stri- Bruce. strictly there you a guess. Go. Who are the three? Fowler, Stenson, and DJ, who was 10th. Okay. Uh, it's funny. Uh, that's funny. Okay. Good news. Hey, real quick, you're yeah. going to see Connor Kelly's return today, covering that game tonight. I, I am. I'm, yeah. I'm excited. Uh, should, should be a lot of fun down in Annapolis, and I would like to invite anybody who's a lacrosse fan to come out and see the MLL because it's a fun game. Yeah, and I assume uh, I would hope that you could get a little video or some audio from after the game tonight. Uh, I will try. Okay. Uh, if it's not raining, I'm more inclined to go down on the field after the game. I don't blame you, but it's not supposed to rain today. All right, let's talk first about Kevin Herter. I, you know, it's all over the globe where he's going to be picked. It's mainly in the first round, but I've seen as low as like 15, and I've also seen 30 to Atlanta. What's yeah, your, what's I, your I take? have two. Yeah. You know, I, I, Bruce, I, I really think that, that Herter is is probably going in, I'm going to guess in like the 18 to 25 range. Um, I, because I've been thinking about this. You know, you, you wanted me on as a, as a hidden draft expert, and I've been thinking about it. And you know who, who Herter uh, kind of reminds me of? Do you remember Caris Levert from Michigan a couple of years ago? I'm not going to say I do because I don't. Okay, so he's a guy who he wasn't very big coming out of not much of a freshman year, but he's like six seven, weighed about thirty five pounds. Now I'm exaggerating, but skinny as a rail coming out of high school. Maybe he weighed one sixty, one seventy. Get when he got to Michigan, developed his body up a, a little bit. His his sophomore year stats, he averaged about thirteen points a game, three and a half rebounds, and four and a half assists and shot 41% from the field. Now, he came back, went junior and senior year, and had a lot of injuries. He was injured and, and missed most of both of those. But think about Herter, 15 points a game, came in a skinny kid out of high school, built himself up a little bit, averaged about 15 points, three and a half assists, and five rebounds a game last year. Yeah, he... I mean, you know, the injury and, doesn't help, but I don't think it's going to hurt him. I really no, don't. I don't think so either. And look, look, Herter started all 65 games at Maryland, never missed a game. So I don't think this injury is going to hurt him. And the reason I brought up Chris Caris Levert is because he went number 20. Okay. Uh, the year, uh, two years ago, he was drafted 20. So I, I can really see Herter going in that range. Um you know, maybe he. Who knows? I don't know. Philadelphia might have some interest in him. Utah. I. I could see him going to Utah. 
you know, if he drops that far, he could hang around and go to the Lakers. Uh, that's uh, a lot of people think that uh, that's a good landing spot for well, him. Well, if the Lakers do what they, the rumors are that they're going to try and do, and that's get Kawhi and LeBron and Paul George, they're going to have to give up Ingram. They're going to have to give up Kuzma. And so what does that mean that you need? You need a great shot. And that's, look, that's what Kevin Herter is banking everything on. And that's why the NBA told him to shut it down after the first day because he had put himself into the first round. He is, you know, that perfect shot. Let's start with number one. I think it's a foregone conclusion. DeAndre Ayton from uh, Arizona is going to be the first pick by Phoenix. And not yeah. because he's, you know, in the Arizona area. It's because he's seven feet and he's fantastic. Yeah, I I agree. I I think and and that seems to be the consensus. It would be probably just a real real shock um, if, if he goes any lower than number one. Marvin Bagley has taken exception to that, and <laughs> he says that he's better. But who knows? Marvin Bagley is a great player from Duke, six foot eleven. And so is uh, Luka Doncic, the uh, the European player, because he was actually the person uh, the personal coach of Luka Doncic is the current head coach of the Suns. The brand new head coach of the Suns worked personally with Luka Doncic for years, and they have a personal relationship. And I'm not sure if uh, number one overall is the spot for him, but there's been a lot of rumors that the Suns could trade back to the Kings pick and uh, potentially take Doncic there. Well, that could happen. Right now, they got him down. The NBA draft uh, that has him down as number four to Memphis. Well, 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 Danny, the thing, the thing, the thing that I'm, I'm really kind of thinking is that regardless of whether the Suns trade down, whoever trades up is trading up to get DeAndre Ayton. Yeah, for That's sure, that, absolutely, for sure. Um, some other guys in the first round. So Wendell Carter has gotten a lot of tremendous uh, pub. Another kid from Duke. I'm gonna tell you, I wonder how Duke ever loses a game. <laughs> I mean, yeah, with the guys they have gone, and uh, Michael Porter Jr. from Missouri is yeah, uh, he's he's another kid who's who's really popped up kind of kind of late on the board. I, he was he's probably a kid who, if there weren't the one and done rule, he'd have probably been a lottery pick coming out of high school. But then he has this back injury, and if you talk about a, a guy who's going to be affected by an injury, when you talked about Herder. If you talk about a guy who's going to be affected by an injury in the draft, I, I think Michael Porter is is probably the poster child for that. Yeah, there's a lot of debate. He had actually fallen down to the bottom of the first round and has come charging back. Uh, Trey Young, what's your take on him? I, You know, you hear such great things, and then you saw him fizz off, you know, as he went to, like, the middle of the year for Oklahoma to the point where Oklahoma just turned into a, a, just a nothing team, per se. Yeah, I, I think that that Trey Young is is going to have to become a, kind of in some ways a more versatile player. I, you know, teams bodied him up a lot, pushed him around, and you know, if if, if that happens at the college level, how how do you think that's going to impact him as an NBA player? I, he's probably going to go in the top five or eight regardless because he's got phenomenal skills. He's got great court vision really can pass the ball well. You know, so he's 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 the kind of kid who who I think somebody's going to take a chance on, but you know, he's he's got to get stronger and I think he's got to get mentally tougher. Did you watch a lot of uh, Mohammed Bamba from Texas? Uh, I, I did not see him a, a lot, but he's you know, he's a legitimate seven-footer. He's a he's just a was a rebounding machine in college. So, you know, I, I mean, I think he's got to develop his offensive game a little bit. I think he's uh, from what I've read about him, he's going to have to develop a little bit as a defender. They say he tends to lose his place on the floor, particularly trying to defend pick and roll. Um, but you know, somebody wants a guy who's going to attack the glass and and has shot blocking ability. You know, and like I said, he's he's legitimate seven feet. Out out of his shoes, he's seven feet. So uh, it's funny. It's a big man draft. Seven foot, six eleven, six eleven, six eight, seven foot, six ten, six ten, six nine, and Trey Young in the top ten. It's a well, big man draft. But we're out of time, Todd. I okay. want to mention one name, and I know you love this guy like I do, and that's Javon Carter from West Virginia. He's kind of like fell back to the second round. 
I'd love to get him in the second round. And with that, we got to say goodbye. Todd, thanks for coming on this morning. Anytime, Bruce. All right, everybody, have a great weekend. Watch the U.S. Open. Maybe the Orioles can get a win. I'll take a split of the last two games. That's how desperate I am. All right, with that, we'll say goodbye. Drive safely. Have a great Father's Day.